I want to welcome you here, all of you today, to the importance of research in the local community. It's a chat with our newest dean, Dean John Williams, who um, you can see, J. Williams 27, on your screens. Um, and, but I'm really happy that you're all here and that you decided to participate in our virtual homecoming. Um, it's, um, I think it'll be a really fun weekend, and I hope you'll join us in some other things as well. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to Acting Chancellor Preble. Um, you can see his, Mark Preble is waving to you. Um, thank you very much, Chancellor, for joining us. Um, I'm really pleased to be here myself um, to introduce uh, John Williams, Dean of the Charlton College of Business, and to learn a, a little bit about CCB today and his interactions uh, with the community. And but before handing the control over to Dean Williams, Please know that this is meant to be a conversation. Uh, so if you have questions, the Dean is quite open to answering them as he goes along. Um, the best way to do that is to either physically raise your hand and we can call on you, or if you prefer, you can um, just type it into the chat and I, I can read it for you if you prefer not to be um, asking questions aloud. You know, so that makes some people uncomfortable. So other than that, I welcome you again, and I welcome Dean Williams. Thank you so much for um, in agreeing to participate in Homecoming. Would you My like pleasure. To, would you like to make a few remarks before we jump right in? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, first of all, it's just great to see all of you, and, and I'm thrilled to be here with you, and I'm also thrilled to be at the University of Massachusetts and uh, be in the Charlton College of Business. Uh, just so you know, uh, this, this isn't new turf for me exactly. I did four years in the Navy in the last year and a half of the Navy. I was in Newport, Rhode Island. So I'm actually quite familiar with the area and, and it's just tremendous to be back here. I love the Northeast and uh, the campus is wonderful. And uh, I can tell you everyone has just been sensational. So it's, it's just a real pleasure to be here. Well, that's good to hear. Um, I love New England. Um, so let's just jump right in. I, I have a question to start, uh, to start us off. Um, we know that research and community partnerships are important to you. Can you speak a little bit about those topics and tell us about any successes you've had in previous institutions and how you plan to bring this about at UMass Dartmouth? It, it's it's an area that's actually growing for colleges of business and, and has been for quite some time. And that is reaching out to stakeholders in the community and developing partnerships. Uh, AACSB, which is the premier accreditation for colleges of business internationally, actually has part of the accreditation, which is a major part, the engagement, innovation, and impact. So it's, it's really imperative that colleges of business interact with the community, get in the, engaged, have an impact with them, and, and bring it through innovation. And probably the prominent way to do that is research. I've been fortunate to have some time uh, since coming on July 1st to hop around the community and talk to stakeholders, talk to business owners, talk to those involved in associations and other businesses that have to do with the economy and what's going on in the area. I can see that there is some need base out there and they've been very forthcoming with me on the different ways that the College of Business can interact with them where we can have uh, a nice ongoing situation and, and we all become stakeholders in this. So just diving into this a little, I can tell you that what I have found out from many organizations and businesses is there's a real lack of data uh, that they can work with. And if you think about data and you think about how that's captured, we're uh, in a real predicament right now with COVID. As we come out of that, uh, we're gonna need data and we're gonna need a set down point with that data to really longitudinally go forward capturing research. If you don't have various set down points for that, it's very difficult to go on from there and do research. 
Well, our college of business happens to be well equipped for this, and I've been talking to the, the college and the faculty and actually the staff also on what we can do and how we can get out there and work. Uh, Anne-Marie, you've asked a question of previous experience and how it may come into this. At my previous position at the University of New Orleans, I was dean there, but in addition to that, I was also director of the Hospitality Research Center, recognized as the premier hospitality and research center in a university in the nation. I also directed the Division of Business and Economic Research in addition to my duties as dean. Uh, the HRC, the Hospitality Research Center, was a Board of Regents Center of Excellence. And there, they judge you every five years on your contracts and the volume of dollars you're bringing in with contracts. And what we did was, as soon as Katrina came aside, I went and met with the stakeholders out there who needed data and needed it going forward. When you looked at all the different industries, what all of those were saying was, we have to throw out 2005. As you know, Katrina happened in August of 2005. They said, throw away 2004 and throw away 2005. It was actually an incomplete year. So we collected with our centers all the data going forward longitudinally on all the industries in particular since it's the leading industry in New Orleans, we went and did all of hospitality and tourism. So we were the collector of that. I can tell you that what we did was a little different. You have hotels and restaurants that, that are one part of tourism, but they happen to be the prominent part. I needed research from restaurants and hotels. I actually went to conflicting interests where it had never happened before, where you got restaurants and hotels together to give me data and then actually share that back and forth between hotels and restaurants. And that was, that was heart shattering for that area. And I can tell you it's never happened in places like Las Vegas or Orlando or other places. That sharing of data that we shared the aggregate and kept confidentiality, but that's what we did. As I'm talking to stakeholders out there, I've, I've, I've kind of gone into this conversation. So this may sound crazy, but I do believe that the wind industry and the seafood industry could actually benefit by sharing data across those two supposedly competing industries. And that's what I'd like to see because academia, we can go out there and we can go and provide that confidentiality bring the aggregate back to them sometime in that form of the research and start to look at the real issues we have there. And my latest conversations as of two weeks ago went a little bit beyond. I'd actually like to see the College of Business doing data mining and, and looking at economic impacts regionally rather than simply down here in the South Coast in certain areas. I'd like to extend that and I'd like to extend it immediately up toward the Boston area. So those are some of the issues that I see. Just to give you an idea of what this can develop into, we started with a uh, center that, that did some decent studies. We evolved into a center where anything that came into the Superdome or the arena, which is a very large arena, we did. So we did the Super Bowl. We did the Men's Final Four, Women's Final Four, BCS Championship the all-star game. We had all of those contracts come in and we did their economic impacts. I did the economic impact for the state of Louisiana. So we studied all the parishes there and did all of their economic impacts. For New Orleans, we did the complete visitor profile of volume each year that was about three inches thick if you measured it. And we kept all that data and kept the profile on the visitor and looked at all of the major festivals. New Orleans being the festival capital of the world, it was only obvious to us, but we had to get into doing those economic things. So we did many, many studies. And we also, uh, another one I directed was the Division of Business and Economic Research. We did the Metropolitan Study and that went across all industries and all industries could do planning from that and actually craft their annual plans as they went forward. So I know this is a lot, but there's got to be a starting point. 
And we need to do that. As a college of business, we actually owe it to the community. AACSB is telling us they're so serious about engagement, innovate, innovation, and impact. They actually took that on as part of their mission also. So AACSB has that as part of their mission, and we've certainly got to fulfill that. That gives you some idea of where we can start out and where we can look at this more assiduously as far as what we can do and how we can bond with all those stakeholders out there. But I can tell you this from all my meetings, there's a tremendous need for this. The College of Business truly needs to be entrenched in this. This is probably a good point to, to take any questions on it if you have any. Yes, Jan. Jan, don't forget to unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you for doing this this afternoon. Um, I, I think it's a great idea. I think um, I'm here in Richmond, Virginia. I think I've been in a meeting before with you and see how much that VCU has done here in the Richmond area to really bring this city um, up in many different ways. Um, I had a question though. You talked about expanding the region toward Boston. And I have to tell you, I, I am biased because I think the South Coast is always neglected in the state of Massachusetts. Maybe that's not the case now. I've been out of state for a while. But when you say going toward Boston, I, my first reaction is, oh, OK, we're going to be left behind again. Um, I, and also, are you talking about Cape Cod as part of the region? I am, and actually, uh, this conversation had some legs on it. So it just didn't come from, it came from our stakeholders out there also that said, we'd like to have another look also at data that's coming out of a broader area to see what's going on. And when you think about the blue economy and the rail coming in in a couple of years, that started to make sense to me as they, we had a discourse on that. That really makes sense to me. I think we need to broaden out exactly what we're looking at. That doesn't mean we take attention away from the South Coast. We need it right here. And I'll just, I'll just be quite candid. I do find that we do have some polarized pockets of influence in this area that could bond a little bit better together. And the way that that may happen is actually through research and data. So that's, that's coming back to me from the stakeholders saying, it would be wonderful if, we, if the region that we actually look at broadens out. Let me tell you that also goes back to we're in a system where we have three other universities. And I think it's important that we reach out and start to look into the other areas and what's going on there also and see how we can connect up. And I do believe in inter interdisciplinary research. I do believe not only growing, going across colleges, but I do believe in going across universities. I had a very, very excellent chance two weeks ago to actually sit down with the president of the system along with the other three uh, business deans and we actually had a great conversation. And we also in that discourse talked about how we can partner together and do things together. I think that's another great way to go. If we're to help this region, I truly believe we've got to spread out and make that conversation have some legs on it with a little bit of distance. I'm really fascinated by the blue economy and looking at that. And when you look at that, the entrails of that really spread out. There's going to have to be some partnerships going forward that are a little more broad based if we're to bring them in and help us. I hope that kind of explains what I've witnessed from the stakeholders and, and what I saw as a reasoning. Okay, great. Thank you. I really like that idea of um, kind of bringing, we spread out towards Boston and bring them to us. And I really like that idea because I think that that, it sounds like you, you'll be keeping us as a hub. We, are, we will be the hub in this conversation. Yeah. Uh, but obviously I can tell you something else. When you work with research centers in data, uh, you want to expand the source that you have for those resources. That should go to this area. If we're to bring resources in, I see other resources out there that are tremendous that can actually help us with our initiatives. Right. Now, you mentioned um, 
I just wanted to go back because you did mention the ASC, AACSB. For me, that's a tongue twister. I don't know why. <laughs> but that's the accrediting organization for the co colleges of business. Is that yes, right? It is the top accrediting body for colleges of business. It's very revered and it is international. Uh, really, uh, honestly, my conversation with this group, if you don't have AACSB accreditation, the other accreditations, they, they can't hold up to it. So you go for AACSB. It's truly a draw in for students. I can tell you students and their parents, first thing they look at on the website, are they AACSB accredited? And a lot of times you don't get a second look if, if you're not, they won't even go in and peruse your website. Hmm. Now, will the, your initiatives for the um, college play out in the growth with the, within the AACSB? Because you, did, you mentioned like engagement, innovation, and impact, and how those are important. Is it possible to grow in your life within the accreditation agency? Do you see what I'm... It is, and that's a, that's a great question. So AACSB basically looks at everything. When they come in, and we've got our visit coming up for November 8th, 9th, and 10th. And uh, they come in and, and it's powerful. So just so you have an idea of that, they're also looking at an area that's called assurance of learning. They wanna make sure that your outcomes for your courses are in line with what they think they should be. So in other words, if you're saying this is what you're trying to achieve in a course, they want to see that you're measuring that and actually able to show that you are producing that. They're concerned with a great product in that graduate upon graduation, but they're also looking for the shelf life of that degree. So how long is the shelf life of that, that degree good for before they have to come in and actually start to pro provide expensive training. So that's truly a competitive thing. That's one business school over another on why you should be chosen for your graduates. And one of them is shelf life. Faculty qualifications are another. So how many PhD faculty do you have? That would be one. What's the type of research they're doing? What's the volume of the research? What's the rigor of the journals that they're putting it into? So it truly is quite expansive when, when they come in and they measure that every five years. Wow, thank you. Um, first, I think we have a question from Tim Shea and then we'll go on to Elise. Yes. Don't forget Hi, to unmute yourselves. Yeah, I don't think I put my hand up. So. Oh, okay, sorry. Enjoying the conversation. Oh, okay, great. Um, uh, Elise? Hi, Elise. So I have two questions. Um, by way of introduction, it sounds like you've had an opportunity to meet yet because of all this COVIDness. <laughs> but um, Elise Proposa, um, in corporate engagement on campus, previously of the Public Policy Center, was involved in some of our blue economy studies and offshore wind studies. So fully appreciate the importance of data. Um, I was what, one of the problems we have with like, the blue economy and offshore wind and um, other similar industries in the region is that there really aren't good data because these are industries that aren't well defined using standard industry classifications or are so new as to not really be captured. And so I'm wondering if your efforts have any plans to kind of get around that in some manner, whether that's through continuous um, data collection or other means. And then my other question um, has to do with entrepreneurship. So we have at this point, a pretty good ecosystem for mom and pop type businesses, but not much around to help those who are starting high tech businesses. They kind of have to go at their own. So I'm wondering if uh, the College of Business is doing anything in that regard. Okay, I'll take the first question first. And, and uh, I'm very interested in, in wind and, and as I mentioned before, seafood industries and, and collecting data. So my conversations have already been with some representatives there. And, and that conversation has blossomed. Uh, I do believe that they can supply us enough information that we can start to get some data pools on this and put some things together and, and see what's working and possibly what's not. I'm also looking for direction from them 
on maybe some benchmarks that they would like to set. If, if I have benchmarks for a center, I can start to link those up with the work we do. And as we set those benchmarks going forward, we can really take a great look at those and, and see where they're at. And it's what I've done with centers and institutes before is, is look at what they have for one, three, five years out and going beyond and, and see what they're looking for with that and then start to, to capture the data around that. Let me just mention that that's very, very important because as you do that, you'll run into something like we encountered. So we were the major collector of all the data following Hurricane Katrina. So we were the data center bringing that in. Well, guess what? It's not too many years later, the BP oil spill came around. That data took a little shift, but it was only a little shift. We had so much data, we could actually do an economic impact right at that moment of the BP oil spill because we already had the network of partners set up. So let me give you the example of hotels and restaurants. We could go out immediately to them, reset the data we had by getting immediate surveys and their cooperation and get an entire feel of those two industries and then plan going forward with BP oil spill on the other side. Remember that the ramifications of Katrina went on for years and years and years and years. It really was a long time coming. I'll tell you something that's, that's you're gonna have a hard time accepting this. At one point in time after the storm, it was about one year later, our Convention and Visitor Bureau contacted Canada because on their website, they had that we were still underwater in New Orleans. That absolutely, I guarantee you, was not true. But yet, it's an example of how things just continue on and you go, well, this is incredible. It's a good thing we have some data to rely on that we can set these benchmarks and set down landing points before we go forward with anything. So that was crucial. So that's one example of we're gonna need some cooperation from industry. If we're to go out and collect this data, they can really help us. But it's, they're gonna to have to actually be willing to do some visioning with us on that so that we can begin the process. On your other question with entrepreneurship, wow, was that a key area? We've done an okay job in the College of Business. It's an okay job. But entrepreneurship over the years has had some bumps. So programs got into entrepreneurship and they made them true programs. So you had a program, a four-year program at many universities that would graduate a person who was going on for entrepreneurship, try to sell that to an organization that considers that person to maybe six months down the road, jumping that organization because they want to open up their own business. So the way a lot of those programs was crafted was you were truly getting an entrepreneurship degree, but they tailored it for you opening up your own business. Industry likes to get some time out of a graduate. They want to see that that graduate is really entrenched with their industry. I think going forward, the smart programs, the smart colleges, looking at a program in it, have altered that. Now, we do not have a program per se in entrepreneurship. But in many of my meetings already, it's been the major conversation. And we've talked about it to several constituents. E for all is one. I had a very nice conversation with Donna. I was glad to see this week, this week here, we actually had another meeting and Donna was actually on that Zoom meeting. So we've got extended conversations. Where's the community in entrepreneurship? Where can we immediately with the entrepreneurship courses we have and the potential for expanded certificates help out as we start to do a visioning of where should the Charlton College of Business really set down on entrepreneurship? What is that model? But I don't want that to just wait as we do grand visioning. I've already had two meetings with the faculty on this, at two different set, subsets of faculty, talking about entrepreneurship and how we can start to partner 
within the industry and help them out with the entrepreneurship piece. It's going to be very vital. I think there's some like e for all doing a wonderful job out there with it. But in my meeting with Donna, she said, we need the academic arm to help us. And that's another area. I'm glad you brought this up, Elise. That's an excellent question. We owe it to the industry to help them any way they can. So one of my offers was, you know, we get out of COVID, please, if you want to have a session or something, a breakaway, do something like that, use our building, come out and, and come into the Charlton College of Business. We've got a fabulous building. Come here, have a break, breakaway session. And also, what can we do meantime to open up the dialogue to start to see how we can help out? Because we've got to do it. You've hit on a really key area. And I hope you and, and, and the rest of us can revisit this and really have a, a, a real good conversation on it. Great. I'm glad to hear that. I'd be happy to. <laughs> Pardon me? So I'm glad to hear that. Oh. Um, so I have, I have a question here. I'm going to take this in a little different direction, but you did mention, you know, kind of circling back. And so I have a question. Um, earlier this year, um, earlier this year, before the semester started, um, there was a great deal of planning and adjusting that went across time um, to create the hybrid model that CCB put in place this fall. And um, now that the semester is in full swing, this person would like to know, how's it going? It's going great. And uh, a, a gentleman who's with us today is largely responsible for that. That's Chancellor Preble. Uh, wow, you all probably know this is extremely difficult. It's, it's difficult for business. It's certainly difficult for academia. So I can tell you the best gauge on this. If, if you're to ask me direct, how is it going? I've got to take the word of the students. I can guarantee you if there's problem areas, I will hear about them. I can tell you from the great planning done by the university in so many areas, this was incredibly smooth. And you can measure that across other universities who have really had difficulty. Uh, you can measure it there and, and it, it will prove out we really uh, had it together to start off with. Now, if I can talk about the College of Business in this vein, I do believe it was, it was the work of our faculty and the work of our advisors that really, really helped. I can tell you that the communications were opened up wide by faculty and advisors. And we have four advisors for undergraduate. I took an assistant position that I have and I put it over in graduate advising to help out the only individual we have over there. So that made two. They really connected with students. And here's what we found out. We got so many calls, so many emails from students. Look at us. We're all having a difficult time through this. We have families, we have friends, we have acquaintances, all kinds of things going on. This is tough. What we found out was if students simply were given the answers to a few questions as they called in, that probably wasn't it. What we found out was a lot of the conversation was simply they wanted to have a conversation. They wanted to have it with people they respect like their advisors and faculty. The attention and time that they gave that was the real key. They simply wanted to have a conversation. So having patience with that, guiding them through the things that they thought were crucial. But those conversations went on and it just was a dialogue going back and forth. I truly believe on the college level, that was the thing where students felt very good because we had to turn a lot of things right on a dime. And when you mentioned hybrid, we literally in the end went true virtual and the only exception for the College of Business truly was the federal guidelines on that, where if you have a student who's new to a program internationally, you had to put one course minimally face-to-face. Uh, -face. So other than that, we were truly virtual. And uh, I have to say from our 
viewpoint, it was, it was pretty uh, flawless as far as getting the students together and getting them going. A lot of people assume that when you take an online course, oh, well, you can sit back for a little while and, and you'll, you'll be okay. Online courses, they start immediate. So there's another dialogue point where uh, that had to be conveyed by faculty and advisors. Look, you're taking an online course, but if you're new to this or if you're a transfer in student, just know that this course starts and you've got to be working right from the get-go. So a lot, those are a lot of issues that enter, entered into it. And it's simply being in there and really helping the student to get started and, and move ahead. That's it. Thanks for that question. Great question. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? I have a couple more that people have asked. Yes, um, I have been at try, trying to ask a question. Tom Flanagan here. Yes, hi, Tom. Hi, thank you, Dean Williams. Uh, and a shout out to Tim Shea as well. I've logged about eight years of adjunct support to the college and I've served on the board of the Alumni Association. But I want to raise an issue from the community. And that is um, one of the community needs is infrastructure renewal. And this is a big, big challenge, but the, it not only includes the flooding issues of being a coastal community, but it also includes infrastructure issues such as water resources and food security. Given the university's special sibling status with other state agencies, it seems that there's an excellent opportunity to manage the complex negotiation that will be involved in renewing existing infrastructures. And I'm wondering if this falls within the, the purview of what you see the college taking on. I'll, I'll approach this from a, from a few levels and I think it's a, a leadership uh, task. And I think it's a faculty task of a college of business to look at this. So, let me give you an idea of my role uh, down in New Orleans. Uh, besides being on several boards, I was also on the Sustainability Commission. Uh, the infrastructure, the water infrastructure of New Orleans is a mess. Uh, and, and the more you look at infrastructure, the more you have to pull in experts to really get an idea of what's going on. If you're familiar with New Orleans, uh, down by Harris Casino, uh, which is right there on Poydras, if you're familiar with that, that Poydras leads out to the Superdome. So you're talking about an incredible area. The infrastructure for water is so compromised, it's a multi-billion dollar job to get it done correctly. There was a pump that they had a problem with. The system is so compromised when they put the pump in down by Harrods, it really compromised the system because it was too powerful. It made the, all the earth give way in the highway down there by Harrods Casino, and all of a sudden, that's my route in. The road was gone, and you, you had to go around it. So when you talk about infrastructure, you're talking about one huge undertaking and being on a sustainability commission, we addressed areas like that. Really, you have to start to bring all the partners in and it fans out like this. So uh, the regional transit authority had to be brought in just because of the lines they have. The, the uh, streetcar system that we have, they had to be brought in. You had to bring all of these constituents together because if you don't coordinate it, th these little band-aids that you put on, just like that pump being put in, which if there was any true foresight in bringing all the partners in, they would have said, well, you may not want to do that right now. You may want to look at the entirety of this system. So I just want to bring that up at the beginning. It becomes very involved when you're looking at something like infrastructure. I'm, I'm only taking a guess, but I would assume it's not quite as foreboding as what I just mentioned in New Orleans, but I can tell you this, it probably has lots of areas that truly have to be looked at and takes cooperation. And you find out very early on that cooperation is a difficult thing. 
because you have so many competing entities that you just have to have a meeting of the minds and someone has to convey to them right. just how serious that issue is and that we can only get through it through cooperation. So that's one idea. And colleges of business, a lot of times, having many entities, when you look at the marketing, management, accounting, finance, go across several of those areas. So colleges, colleges of business actually are one good starting point to bring in because they do cover so many areas. I was fortunate that I had an institute of real estate in New Orleans, so we could really help out because we had so many key entities looking at the infrastructure in New Orleans. The data we could supply was tremendous, and I'll give you an idea of that. That volume we increased every year was this large. We had two seminars, one on the North Shore, so if you're familiar with the area, across Lake Pontchartrain on the North Shore. We attracted 200 to that seminar each year as we would shoot that date out. For the one in New Orleans, we held that on campus. We never had under 400 attend that. So not only did we give to real estate people continuing education points, but they crafted their annual plans out of that. So you can start to see the breadth of what a college of business can offer as you get them to take a part in, in something like an infrastructure and go, ongoing. I mentioned sustainability and that's one crucial piece where you decide where you're at, what's sustainable and what you want to achieve going forward with that sustainability piece. So I mentioned that at the beginning, but that truly is only one part of it all. I hope that kind of explained where a college of business might come into play with that and, and, and how we could hopefully help out with some of it. Yes, thank you. That's, that's very encouraging. I, I think that it's intensely, uh, it's negotiation intensive as well as information intensive. And I, I do think that there's a, a lot that could be done to help out. Thank you for the question. Great question. Yes, thank you, Tom. Sorry that I didn't recognize your hand there. Sorry. Sorry. As I say, I'm new to, new to this part. Anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask? I have one here. Um, so what do you believe is the best thing about this fall semester for your students and faculty? I, I have to say that that would probably come down to the safety issue. And once again, thanks to Chancellor Preble on this. Uh, he gave us a great report a few days ago uh, on testing and the results were just phenomenal basically that and, and Mark, uh, Dr. Uh, Chancellor Preble, please correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I do believe that testing was uh, a two-day turnaround. It, it actually in most cases it's been less than 24 hours. It's terrific, uh, terrific turnaround in the testing. And, that, and that's sensational. And then, and then there were uh, great results. Uh, I believe there were no cases at all found. So we have had, um, since we've started testing, we've had 10, we, we have uh, conducted 10,000 tests of our students. Um, and we've had, we've had 27 asymptomatic positives. Um, that we uh, moved to isolation. Most of them have gone through isolation and are now back in the regular population. Uh, but no one has really gotten sick. We've had a few minor symptoms that um, students have reported, but nobody's gotten sick. So we're really, we're really uh, very fortunate. Uh, but the testing, we have a tremendous um, uh, contact tracing program along with the local boards of health. Um, so we do a lot of uh, quarantining um, for anybody who has had close contact with uh, students who test positive. So it's really been a good program. And, and just enhancing on that, that, that gave everyone a little pause. Everyone was able to relax quite a bit. Faculty, staff, students felt comfortable. Uh, 
oh, you've got enough pressure without wor worrying about safety concerns. So that, that was enormous. So it was just a great job done by the university. And uh, I, I'd have to put that as, as the top on that list. That's great. That's, um, that's so encouraging. You know, we've been hearing the horror stories, of course, on the news about the colleges that haven't done so well, but you don't hear about how wonderfully well we're, we're doing. So um, I like that. I like the positive news spin. It's good to hear, um, you know, done effectively, done well. Thank you. Um, so I think we're coming to a close here. If people don't have any other questions, um, Dean, if you'd like to, Dean Williams, if you'd like to um, give us some final thoughts, that would be terrific. Um, My final thoughts are, uh, let's keep the communication going. Uh, the, the only way we do well is when our stakeholders uh, give us information. And, and I'll just say that that goes across everything. So when we're thinking about new programs, we're out there talking to industry, we're talking to the stakeholders. Is this a viable new program? Do, do you stand behind this? So it's, it's programmatic. It's how we work with the industry. What, where do you see us doing this? We're wide open on these slots. Only you can give us the very best ideas. And, and you're all alumni also. So you have a great idea of what the university was about, what our college was about, where it's heading, where you may think we've lost some ground. Trust me, we, we, we may blush a little, but we'll move on from that and we will truly listen. We want to listen. We want to grow and get better. I'm, I'm here at this university and this college because the potential is just unbelievable here. You've got things in this South Coast community going on that are terrific. And we want to be part of it. We want to help out anywhere we can. So we share that with others. We're here to help out any way we can. That's what colleges of business do these days. So we want to be a part of it. And, and I really want to thank you for your time today. This is great that you take this much time out of your day just to link up and, and have a, a dialogue with us. So thank you very much. And thank you, yes. Thank you all for attending. I hope that you are enjoying virtual homecoming so far and that you'll join us for some other events later on. I'm encouraging everyone to come to my bingo tomorrow night. As that's how we'll close out the tomorrow evening. It's sure to be fun and we do have prizes. Um, so thank you all very much for attending. If you need anything, um, you can go on to the homecoming website um, and there's a link there that can get you um, to, you know, talk to our um, Josh, who's our ringleader, or um, there are now links to everything up on the website so that if you didn't register for something and you want to come, you don't have to go through the pro process of of re-registering. Re you can just pop on there at will and click on whatever looks interesting. So thank you all very much for attending. Thank you, Chancellor Preble. And uh, again, thank you, Dean Williams. I really appreciate your time today.